I remember this perfectly. This is that we're at a red light. He stops in the intersection and he's like, block, like he stopped at the end of the intersection. So I'm in the intersection. Yeah. He, he's fucked me. And this car's coming this way on the right. So I didn't know what to do. The guy, there's a bar on the corner. This guy in a leather jacket, I remember, bald guy, runs out of the bar, jumps in my back seat, pulls my friend, uh, psycho yep. friend, Bad in move. the back, and they're just fighting. What's up, guys, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the podcast. Before we start, this is a quick announcement to let you guys know that I'm dropping bonus episodes on Auxoro Premium. For the price of an iced coffee per month, you get two bonus episodes of my show, The Aux, every month that covers exciting, deep, and sometimes twisted topics like MK Ultra, the COVID lab leak hypothesis, Fight Club, dating, the obesity epidemic, ayahuasca, alien encounters, and more for less than five bucks per month. In addition to two bonus episodes per month, you also get exclusive Ask Me Anything episodes, the ability to submit topic suggestions for the Aux and the Auxoro podcast, and access to all archived bonus episodes to binge at your leisure. Right now, there's over 25 hours of archived content, and it grows every month. For the best deal in premium podcasting, visit auxoro.supercast.com to sign up today. No topic off limits. That's auxoro, A-U-X-O-R-O dot supercast.com. Thank you for your support. And now on to the episode. So Mark, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it on the hey, Auxoro hey. podcast and Shout out to Gotham Podcast Studio for giving us the the great treatment today. Love Appreciate it, Gotham. guys. Good good place over here. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to start with something that happened recently, which is Bob Saget passing away. Is that right? I hadn't heard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I'm kidding. He's uh <laughs> yeah, it uh it happened. He's uh no longer with us and I saw Penn Jillette wrote this op-ed actually in the New York Times, he, and he was really good friends with Bob Saget, uh, Penn and Teller from the Magician. Sure, group. sure, I know Gillette. Yeah, and uh, sold him a few jokes uh, once. What do you think about him? Well, uh, about the jokes, how did you uh, did you kill with him? Uh, well, yeah, I didn't kill Saget, but uh, I uh, <laughs> Penn Jillette saw some Twitter jokes of mine, and he was like, "These jokes would work great in my act. Can I buy them?" And I was like, "Yeah, sure. I'll just I'm just tweeting them." So that was it. That was my only interaction with Penn Jillette. He was a nice guy, but he paid handsomely for a couple tweets. Does that happen a lot? Will, will people hit you up that are also celebrities or comedians or both and, and be like, I, I want to buy that last tweet or, or that last, you know, if, if it's not already out there as you, will people try to snag that? Actually, not as much as you think. Uh, fun fact, the first money, like first real money I ever made in comedy, $1,500. Uh, Larry, the cable guy, bought five jokes from me and gave me 1500 bucks, and they were bullshit jokes I had written down in a notebook, and my manager at the time was like, do you have anything? You're worthless. I was an open micer, and I was like, I wrote these jokes, and he goes, eh, and he was managing Larry, the cable guy as well, and he was like, Larry, the cable guy, do you want these? And he happened to be doing a roast, and he's like, I'll take them. I got no jokes, and they were they were horrible jokes, but uh, he could somehow use them in the roast, yeah. and- that was like my big my big sale. I I always wondered why there's there's not really any covers in comedy like in music yeah. when you start out I could get on stage and uh like one of my favorite artists is Black Bear. He a uh, singer does the the mm. Hot Girl Bummer song. Okay. Um that was blown up last year and um Hot Girl Bummer? Hot Girl Bummer. Oh. Off of Hot Girl Summer about all the hoes that uh did him wrong. Oh, I like it. Yeah, I like hot, it. hot you're being a hot girl bummer. And so I I could get on stage and I could do a Black Bear cover and that's right. understood. You know, it's not my material. I'm I'm paying homage to this guy, but you know, I can't get on stage and do it with tight five midgets by Mark Norman. Be right. like, this is this is uh Mark Norman 2011. Yeah. Uh I'm gonna do this this bit now. You probably could, but it I think people want your point of view. Like you could go up and do my act and it might do well, it might not. But uh if you said, Hey, this is from some other guy. I think uh, it takes mm. the whole specialness of comedy away. Yeah. yeah, like you're losing the perspective. Yeah, where's the song? You can just tap right in and, and get in there. Yeah. So uh, th the reason I brought up Penn Jillette is uh, he, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about his friend Bob Saget. Look and at you. You did your homework. Yeah, you there printed you go. shit out. I love yeah. it. Being a good boy. And uh, I wanted to read you an excerpt. So he says Ooh, please. about Bob Saget. 
This is Penn Jillette. We now consume much of our art in bite-sized chunks. Yep. Sometimes just sec in a video stripped of context, the message without the messenger. When my children watched little snippets of Bob and read some quotes, they couldn't know that Bob Saget didn't do transgressive comedy to be mean. He didn't even do it to shock. He did it to make people laugh, to test himself, and to let the audience uh, test him and to form a connection with them. So RIP Bob Saget. And uh, ab about that connection, do you, do you feel that connection when you go on stage with the audience, like a mutual level of trust? Or, or is it more like you're, you're saying and you're getting a reaction, but there's not like a, a back and forth energy there? How does that feel when you get on stage? It's a good question. Uh, I'm worried we're boring the, uh, the audience. But hey, you got you to gotta press on. Uh, oh, they're hanging on with us. Okay. That's all I needed. Yeah. But uh, I think... You're killing. All right. Well, I'm kind of getting to this place now where I'm yeah. having people come out to see me, which is uh, new and fun and awesome. And they trust me. They'll meet you halfway. But I still do all these spots all over the city. I did four last night. I'm doing four tonight at different comedy clubs. And these are tourists. These are foreigners. These are, you know, blue-collar people or, or finance people. They don't know who the fuck I am. So those people, you have to earn their trust, and you earn their trust by opening with some tried and true, and they go, okay, this guy's funny, we'll listen. And uh, that's that's a hard part about comedy. But with Bob, we all know him. The problem mm -hmm. with Bob Saget is he's on the Full House show, he's on America's Funniest Home Videos, he's America's dad, he's cute, he's clean, he's squeaky, he's buttoned up, and then he comes out talking about pedophilia for 20 minutes. So I think mm -hmm. he scares the shit out of people. But I have a theory that dirty comics are the sweetest people. And these clean comics, Cosby, <laughs> I think they got some, some shit hidden. I'm not saying all clean yeah. comics are scary, psycho, rapist criminals, but I think they're, they're hiding something. I think if you get it out on stage, audiences are so, are so fucking stupid. If you get it out on stage, people go, he's talking about pedophilia. He must be yeah. a pedophile. It's like, are you fucking nuts, you soccer mom, Karen cunt? <laughs> this guy is saying it. If he was actually a pedophile, he would never mention pedophilia. You yeah. know? So, uh, I yeah, think... Yeah, they, they would be, be on to him. That, that wouldn't be a good move. Yes! That'd be horrible. But the out... He's getting he's getting his dirty... We all have fucked up thoughts. We do this thing where we, you know, get people in trouble or shame them or cancel them, whatever you want to call it. Like, like, like the person who's canceling you has never done mm -hmm. anything wrong. You know, they're perfect. They're morally superior. No, we're all fucked up. We're all animals. We're all twisted. Some people are just better at hiding it. Some people maybe haven't tweeted it or have a don't have a stand-up act where they talk about crazy shit. But uh, yeah, he's had fucked up thoughts. They're funny. And the reason they're funny is because they're fucked up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, pedophilia is horrific and crazy and all this shit, but he's trying to make light of it. Yeah, it's like Everyone has that baggage. Everyone has that emotional shit that they need to get out. Yeah. And then if you have someone that's super clean, whether they're a, a comedian or, or a construction worker or whatever, like people show up to work and then they put on this yes. facade of a clean personality. And if you're never kind of getting shit in the back door of letting all that dirty stuff out of your mind and opening up the the gasket every yeah. once in a while, then, it, then it's all pent up. And then, you know, you're... Uh, dropping pills in uh ladies drinks or you're doing uh pedophilia whatever sure. uh, but yeah it's uh i i have the the same feeling if someone's too too uh squeaky like, yeah too squeaky too like performative yes. too it's like too you, perfect it's like you hear the niceness and the 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 squeakiness in their voice but yeah. then you know there's something behind yes. it it's almost like a deadness to them when they're like i gotta keep this shit down so i'm gonna keep this act going it's like they're doing fucking stand up all the time right. like they're only letting the, the clean shit out and that's even scary because now they're building up this just uh pile of of sin inside them when they're gonna get yeah. it out somewhere and it's gonna be with a lady in, a, in an alleyway or whatever the fuck it is or a kid and in, in a playground or a van but he i, I do want to say every comic now is like everybody's offended and people get mad at me and try to censor me. It's like, all right, this is nothing new. This shit's been happening since the dawn of time. But what did change is now we're rewarding people for busting the guy or the gal. Mm. And that's where like, now it's like currency to, I, I caught that guy with his bad jokes or his inappropriate humor problematic. So it used to just be like some crazy religious psycho is like, 
put Lenny Bruce in jail. He said cocksucker. Yeah. And now it's like, put the uh, Bob Saget, get him off the stage because he said a pedophile joke. Look at me, guys. Yeah. I hate pedophilia. Yeah. And you're it, like, yeah, yeah, I get it, but he hates it too. But you just want the clicks. It's, yeah, it's it's because it, it's not the the criticism that's necessarily the bad thing. Like, it, and and I experience that on a, on a much smaller level than you, obviously. But when someone reaches out to me privately about a podcast and says, "Hey, you know, you you said this about trans people or right. whatever," and I just want to let you know I've had this experience, and a lot of what you said is true, but also this is something that is not like you, you should definitely look more into this. I appreciate the hell out of that. But then if that same person went on Twitter yeah. and was like, retweet how much a piece of garbage yeah. asshole you are, they're doing it for points. But when it's in my DMs or you know, the text, I'm like, that's uh, that's adding to my you know, podcasting because I'm, I'm getting the, the feedback and, right. and I appreciate it. And maybe I'll have them on the podcast. Who knows? Yeah. But. And it's constructive. And we can actually have a dialogue and discuss. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe I am yeah. going too far. Let's discuss it. But to just go, you're a piece of shit. Look, everybody, what a piece of shit. And look at this article I wrote about it. Hire me. You yeah. know, I called out this piece of shit. And you're like, all right, come on. You're not moral. You're just a narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. But Bob, Bob Saget's a, a rare person because I, I don't know anyone else who I enjoyed for different reasons, but the same intensity as a 10 year old and also a 28 year old. Like when I watched full house with my mom and I was 10 years old, like I really enjoy that side of Bob Saget. Maybe I would still enjoy it. I haven't watched full house in, in a really long time, but then I discovered his comedy when I was probably 21, 22, just looking on YouTube yeah. last year of college. And I was like, Holy shit. I had no idea Bob Saget was, you know, this type Filthy. of stand up, And, and I, enjoyed the shit out of it. And I, I felt like I was meeting a new person, but I wasn't. And I, and I can't think of someone else who was in my life at 10 watching them. And now they're in my life at 28, completely different right. shit. But it's also, it's like working for me at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it's a crazy combo. It's so, a crazy combo. So I get why people are like, what the fuck? I thought yeah. he was this guy, but he turned out to be that guy. Yeah. But, but everybody's fucked up. I don't know. We we're getting into this weird thing. where like, we used to have HR at work. You go to the office, you can't uh, tell a lady, hey, great tits. Obviously, <laughs> it's an office, you know? I mean, you're thinking great yeah. tits, but you can't say it. And now we're kind of getting to this HR culture where it's like, you got to be like that everywhere because mm. everything is online. Everything is, is public now. So it kind of makes sense that HR would just grow out to every place on the internet, you know, because it, that's how we live now. Everything is is... Um, exposed. Hey guys, this is a quick break in the episode to remind you that you can sign up for Auxoro Premium to get two bonus episodes every month on topics like MK Ultra, Free Will, Ayahuasca, Fight Club, Dating, Aliens, UFOs, and more. No topic off limits. Head to auxoro.supercast.com. That's A U X O R O.supercast.com to get the best deal in premium podcasting for less than the price of an iced coffee per month. Auxoro.supercast.com. Now, back to the episode. Yes, yeah, like a like a global network of HR yes. on Twitter, and everyone's working for them, or the yeah. a lot of the blue yeah. check marks are working for them. But no one's getting paid. Like people are getting fired up and acting like HR, but they're not getting paid to do it. So it's a I weird know. thing. It's like you're inviting all of this. But this they are anger. getting paid. They're getting paid in in uh, in the in, social in, currency. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's the payment now. Yeah. And if you're a talentless fucking loser who can't create anything, that is your creation. Look at me. Yeah. I'm the I'm the guy who took down Bob Johnson, the the yeah. pedo joke guy. That's my claim to fame. So it's like if if you're a uh, if you're a blue check mark on Twitter, you could be a high class hooker for social currency. If you if you yeah. see something, you can accept that social currency sure. and be like, "I'm I'm down to do whatever. I'll, I'll get dirty for you. I'll I'll say whatever you want if you give me those points." Yeah, and I don't get why we pick and choose. Like, if look, if you're one of these, hey, you can't say that. Hey, that's offensive. Hey, your words are hurtful or whatever. I get it. You can be that person. That's your choice. That's your life. But they pick and choose when other people do it. They don't say anything. Like, like Dave Chappelle was the transphobe. It was the biggest news on the planet. And that trans lady kept being like, his words are violence. And then we found her tweets. And it was like, I beat up that Asian N-word. Fuck this Asian mm -hmm. homo, fag, whatever. And you're like, okay, what about her? Get her now. And they did. Yeah. And you're like, well, why didn't you get her? So you really don't give a shit. If you yeah. really gave a shit, you'd be a little consistent. 
but yeah. they're not because she's not famous and he is. Yeah. I assume. I assume that's why. If you really care, go after her as well. Yeah. D- didn't you say Rogan was getting in some stuff for uh, apparently having, he's having in trouble. a guy on him? Yeah, because of the Va- the vaccine misinformation. Yada, yeah, yada yada. That's that's a weird one because he's. It's not surprising, but to have someone who puts out every piece of content to 10 yeah. million people right. just downloads and then another, you know, 10 million when he was on YouTube and now people are watching on Spotify. It's like you have these people that are going to freak out and that's going to be three people, maybe two people out of a thousand. But then when you have 18 million people listening to an episode, that 18, that three people becomes like 30,000 or, you know, 300,000. So yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how he handles the backlash, but I don't it's, either. Uh, he, he's he doing just, it. He kicks a bag. He he takes DMT. He's like a super yeah. nice, open-minded guy, and uh, everybody. He's like, we need a we need an enemy. We had Trump, and then we had this guy, then we have that guy, then we have him. So I I don't know. You need that like common enemy to to yell yeah. at, I guess. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how how you prep for Rogan because you you crush it when you go on there. You have great episodes. I oh, saw thanks. I saw the one with uh, the the most recent one you did with Shane Gillis and Ari Shafir. Mm-hmm. Those are hilarious too. And your solo episodes, you crush. Oh, thanks! I had uh, no idea. And so, I wanted to know how do you prepare for that sort of setting where you're you're not on stage, you're not doing you know fifteen thirty. You're you have to be. You don't have to be funny, but your goal, I would assume, is to be funny for. 17 hours however <laughs> however long he's gonna right, record right. How, what do you uh kind of do before an episode like that well i look at rogan as as it's just another podcast but this anything that's going to be seen a lot i prepare for like netflix my youtube special rogan some other podcast that has a zillion views i just it doesn't matter that it's rogan it matters that it's, it's a giant podcast platform mm. so the first one i did I prepped like a motherfucker. I had all my stories ready because you don't want to sit there and be like, oh, what was that thing? Oh, I got something. You know, you don't want any dead air. You want to just bring it. And uh, but then you also don't want to try too hard. You don't want to perform too much, but you also want to be funny. So it's this weird balance. But I remember I was going in to Rogan and I called Ari because he's done it a million times. He used to open for Rogan. He knows him for years. And I go, I did a Tonight Show. I got drunk in L.A. and then woke up and I'm on my way to Rogan now. I'm, I'm still in my suit. And is that crazy? Should I go change? Should I go to the yeah. Gap right now and buy an outfit, like a T-shirt, so I don't look like a, a weirdo? And he goes, you're already overthinking it. Just go yeah. in. Just have yeah. fun. And I was like, ah, you're right. And that's, I think that's the key. Don't, don't sit there. I mean, look, prepare, but don't have a script. Don't have uh, buttons like, oh, I'm going to, when he says this, I'm going to say that. You know, just go in and uh, be you, be funny, but be natural. Yeah, and you did have the suit the first time. Yeah, right. That's and, why. And it worked out. Yeah, I, I fucking I was celebrating after tonight show, and I'm like, I got Rogan tomorrow. It's a great weekend. Here we go. And then I overslept, and I had to go straight there. Yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a weird dynamic, and, and I feel the the tension between trying to come off genuine, but also preparing from the the host end. And, yeah. and Rogan does it so well, obviously. Like he, he's you know one of my heroes in podcasting. And even right now, like having notes in front of me, but then also talking and being in the moment, it's like, I know that something's going to come up, like maybe a story on a podcast. And mm-hmm. I want to be able to to talk about that. And at the same time, I want to listen, listen to what you're saying right now. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm always, I'm always experimenting with like, what's the right way to, you're doing great. to do shit. You're doing great. Good questions. Yeah. You're natural. Nice guy. Likeable. All right, so let, let's tank this then. I'm, I'm doing All too right. well. All right, here we go. Um, and I appreciate the wood, the Woodford. Oh yeah, I, I got another. I got a, a present for you at the end. Oh, so we'll, uh, with the gifts. Come yep. on, you don't um, have to do that. So, I was just down in New Orleans. Hey. In October. Who that? Crazy city. Ne- never. I've never been in a city that goes harder for Halloween. Oh, they go hard. Uh, Frenchman I, Street. I was down there the week before Halloween, and it was the first parade that they had since COVID, since the beginning of COVID. So everyone was, was out there and getting rowdy Yep, and uh, a great time. So I, I wanted to know what's your favorite story to tell about New Orleans, something that happened to you in New Orleans <laughs> could, could be growing up, anything that sticks out 
yeah. uh, about an experience you had growing up there. Well, I've told all my crazy ones. You know, I, I grew up in a bed and breakfast in Treme, which is a town or the neighborhood right outside the quarter. Uh, I had a transgender nanny. We got robbed all the time. My parents got held up at gunpoint one time. Uh, I lost my virginity to a prostitute on Bourbon Street. I, uh, I One time was a crazy story where I had, Drove a car. We bumped a guy. He he called a friend. The friend jumped out, ran out of a bar, jumped. I had a convertible. He jumped in the back seat. He's fighting my friend. We pushed him out. He called the cops. It was. I got a million stories. What, what's the? Let's get into the the last one. The guy that jumped into your yeah. car. I, I haven't heard that one yet. Really? No. Oh, I've told it. I think I told it on Bert's pod, but uh, I'll give you the short version. Yeah. So it was like the year, the uh, the week of graduation, senior year. So high school's ending. It was a huge deal. You know, I went to a Catholic high school with a bunch of meathead retard guys. And uh, so we had like a half day or whatever. So it was a Friday. So we said, we're getting out at noon. We're all going to this park and we're going to buy a bunch of kegs and just drink in the sunshine mm. all day. Mm. You know, 17 year old shit. Yeah, day, day drinking. Yeah. Good times. Exactly. Yeah. So being drunk when the sun's up. Exactly. So, uh, you know, we're throwing frisbee, we're, we're wrestling, whatever the hell it is. And so we get word. I had a beeper back then. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> and we get word, hey, uh, Jay's having a party at his house. So we're like, woo, now we're all tuned up from the booze and the sun's going down. So we're like, let's go to Jay's house. So we get on the highway. It's rush hour. It's like five, six o'clock. I'm on the highway. It's bumper to bumper. I got a 1971 Cutlass mm. convertible. Beautiful Oldsmobile. And uh, I need to get off on this exit. And this guy, I'm like, can I get in? Can I get in? I'm hammered. And the guy's yeah. like, uh, no. And he kind of like, fuck, fuck off. So I get behind him and I bump him because I was pissed. So this a is all my tap. fault. A little love yeah, tap. A little love tap. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nobody got hurt. Nobody, yeah. no damage done. But. I realize I'm in the wrong here. This mm. guy could probably see this and fuck my world up. But uh, gave him a love tap, and I'm sitting there with my buddy. Now, my friend is a psycho. He's, uh, I think he was a freshman at the time, so he was like 14. He looked yeah. like a nine-year-old. He's skinny. He's wiry. He's got, you know, fucking disheveled hair. He's sticky. He's young. He's, you know, he's got chocolate around his mouth. He's a kid. He's a psycho in training. Yes. Yes, there you go. But he would do anything you said. That's the only reason we hung out with him. We're seniors, and I'm hanging out with this kid because you could say, hey, go up to that guy and punch him in the face, and he would do it. He was that kid. It's a good friend to have. Good friend to have. You never know when you're going to play that card. He's now in jail, obviously. But uh, this kid was like a living legend. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we look like weirdos hanging out with him, but he was that wild. I mean, he skipped school to come drink with us as a freshman. This kid yeah. was a, a psycho, but great kid. And uh, I think his dad died in front of him. Ah, he's got a whole history. But uh, so I'm with him and we bump the guy. So the guy's like in the mirror, like the rear view, mm -hmm. like, what the fuck? I'll kill you. You know, and we're like, all right, whatever. I got, I got this guy here. I'm fine. And so I bump him again because I'm like, hey, you mm -hmm. want to you want to go? Let's go. And then he puts the car in park, gets out, walks past me. So you're kind of like, uh oh, here we go. He's he's yeah. walking towards us, walks past me, gets my license plate, slams on the trunk, and gets back in his car. And we were kind of like, oh, that was weird. Yeah. All right, whatever. So he, he just got right back in his car. Got right back in his car. So we thought like this is it. He's gonna like yeah. swing at us, or but it was it was a smart move. And we're like, all right, whatever. Now he pulls out a fucking Nokia brick from '88. And oh he's yeah, like the fucking uh, Wall Street cell phone. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. And uh, I was like, oh, that's weird. Whatever. Okay. It's 2001, 2000. I don't know. And so now we get off the interstate. Now we're on the the street level, and we're on Magazine Street uh, and race. I remember this perfectly. This is that we're at a red light. He stops in the intersection, and he's like. Block, like he stops at the end of the intersection so i'm in the intersection like you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. He, he's fucked me and this car's coming this way on the right so i didn't know what to do the guy there's a bar on the corner this guy in a leather jacket i remember bald guy runs out of the bar jumps in my back seat pulls my friend 14 year old the friend, psycho friend psycho, the psycho yep. friend Bad in move. the back, and they're just fighting like it's a like a swashbuckler movie or like Roadhouse. They're just on their knees on a back seat, fist fighting each other. This is a, now, a man. Now, is your friend like is he the psycho friend that sadistically enjoys getting in fights? Like, yeah. Like I would have a friend. I had a friend growing up where 
you would hit him in the face and he he would enjoy it. Like he'd literally start <laughs> smiling. He'd be yeah. like, hit me again, motherfucker. Like, is he that kind he of friend? He was completely that guy. But he's little, which is yeah. even scarier. You know, it's like, you know, they make every ghost movie has a little kid as the ghost because kids yeah. are fucking scary. Yeah. And this kid's got nothing to lose. His dad was shot in front of him. He's sticky. He's got chocolate on him. God damn. He's going at it. So yeah. there's like, ah, and I'm like trying to steer, but also hit the guy. And I just panic. I go, throw him out, throw him out. So this kid gets like a, like mom strength when the kid's under the car and they flip mm. the car over. Yeah. He gets mom strength and he just grabs the guy, throws him. I watch him roll over my trunk and just roll on the ground like in a movie. So we're like, I'm just freaking out. It's like six in the afternoon mm -hmm. in the middle of a major city. And this guy's just rolling on the ground. And I'm like, what the fuck? This really escalated. What are we going to do? So we get to Jay's house. We tell everybody the story. We're like, this is crazy. We get even drunker. It kind of time passes by. Now my beeper's going crazy. Beep, beep, 911. Boop, boop, emergency. Beep, mm. boop, boop. I'm like, what the hell? So it's my mom. And she's like, answer me, answer me, answer me. So I call my mom, and I'm like doing my good sober voice. Hello, mother. And she's like, get over here. The cops are here. What the hell did you do? You killed a guy. He's in the hospital. <laughs> You're going to jail. Your life is over. And I'm like, yeah. Ah! So I'm like, I got to go home. And my friend goes, wait, if you're going home, eat this. And he pulls out a big jiff, and he scoops a hand out and puts it in my mouth. And that, that was your, the, the same psycho friend gave you different the guy. different guy. That was Jay. Guy. That was Jay the party was guy. Yeah. Okay. So you got the one friend, you got some good friends right there. Yeah. You got the one friend that's willing to get his ass kicked in a fight and he enjoys it. Yeah. So he's getting something out of it selfishly, you know, maybe he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to have a good day. So he's like, I'm just going to fucking throw myself in there. Totally. And then the other friend wants to absorb the alcohol in your system with the peanut butter. So well. he's thinking about, you know. How am I going to look out for Mark's health? And the exactly. other one's like, how am I going to look out for Mark's health? Yeah, Two yeah. Two different ways both come together. Good guys. So a beautiful story. It was the peanut butter was for the breath. Oh, that, that's okay. That's a move yeah. for the kids that at is, home. So peanut, yeah, that's a good point. So it, it soaks up the alcohol and then you can also talk to your mom in person yes. with the sober voice that you practice on the phone. Exactly. And then, uh, and then you're good to go. Yeah, so, you know, I'm petrified, but the booze is keeping me calm. I get to my house, there's eight cop cars there. I walk in, and there's, like, four cops in my in my living room drinking coffee out of a little thing, you know? My Probably mom, some whiskey in there. Yeah, yeah, but my mom's, like, you know, serving them. It was super weird. And they're like, sit down, what happened? And I tell them my whole story, and I'm in my head, I'm like, I'm nailing this, but I'm probably like, ah, you know, I'm, I don't remember it. But uh, the cop was like, look, I'm on a level with you, kid. This guy says you pushed him out of a car and ran him over. If that's true, you're in a lot of trouble. Let's go outside and see the car. And he goes out and he goes, that fits the description. I'm like, I didn't run over anybody. I swear to God, a guy jumped in my car. I tried to keep it somewhat truthful. And he goes, let me smell your breath. And I breathed right in the cop's face. He was like, well, you don't smell like alcohol. And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I was like, I maybe had a beer at two o'clock, you know? And he's like, all right, all right. And then they left. And my parents are like, what the hell's wrong with you? What really happened? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, eventually I got a subpoena. I got sued yeah. or whatever. I got to go to court. And so long story short, we went to court, me and my dad, and the guy didn't show up. The the guy, uh, this whole time, the guy didn't show up to court and then you just, nothing happens then. Does that was it? it. Like you just get off. You just got off. He doesn't show up to defend himself. Apparently, yeah. Yeah, so, wow. So moral of the story, keep Keep peanut butter in your uh, <laughs> yes, glove box, yes. you know, just in case, exactly. whether you're solo driving or, or driving with friends. And uh, yeah, so this guy's still in jail then, your, your psycho friend. I or, believe. He, he went to boarding school when we were, when like a few years later, like boarding school, like off in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. Mm. And then after that, I think he got some drug stuff and went to jail. He sounds like a fun prison pen pal to have. I, I was looking into that during the, the pandemic because I was, you know, bored like millions of other people. Yeah. And prison pen pals came up and, you know, he, he, he probably writes some colorful letters back and forth. And I should keep in touch. Yeah. I'm sure he's, uh, you know, like a, like an Aryan nation guy in prison. Yeah. <laughs> After he runs that yard with an iron fist. Yeah, so it's still got the iron fist that he <laughs> developed as a child. Now, now hopefully his body has grown into the fist. Yeah, you hope, because he was a little dude. Yeah. Uh, so, so speaking of buzz driving, mm -hmm. I feel like drinking, and it's separate from driving, um, 
is becoming less popular. Like like yeah. the, the <laughs> act, like popular. like the act of just having a drink after work. It feels like now everyone's on uh, like they're smoking weed or, right. or CBD, uh, Xanax, and, and you know nothing wrong with those. Whatever gets you off. Sure. Um, but you you and Sam Morell, you have the the podcast. We might be drunk. You guys have, uh, you know, you enjoy drinking. You've said, you know, it's like you, you learn how to drink when you're an adult and uh, you make it work. And yeah. so, yeah, just, it just seems like drinking is going out of style. I had, a, you know, my blackout phase during college and then learned to slowly drink as an adult. And there I, you and go. I, and so for you, what what are like your favorite uh or, or what's your what's your journey been like with with drinking essentially? Like, how have you learned to drink like an adult? For those people out there who are, you know, struggling with not blacking out every single night because you have to do it during podcasts, and then you go on set, uh, you go on stage, you have a drink, and then you can keep it going for an entire day. So, what are your kind of tips for keeping it going? Uh, well, I'm much like you. I had the horrible, you know, ten years of just blacking out, wetting the bed, uh, getting, you know, I, w- I got woken up in, a, in a, my car once. I was covered in piss, and a cop knocked on my window. I fell asleep in my car. I I fell asleep on the highway once and woke up, and I was riding the guardrails in my car, and had oh to, yeah, had to get the uh, the tire change and all that. Riding on the rim, I mean, just horrible shit. I'm an idiot, and I realize it's all my fault. Uh, I'm lucky to be alive. But uh, a lot of booze, and then then what got what gets you is the shame that that hangover shame of like what am I doing with my life? Mm. You're hungover till five the next day. You have to not answer your phone. You close the blinds. You're like a just a piece of shit troll by your yeah. you know the boiler room. <laughs> like ah, what am I doing? And then you jerk off, and then you watch TV, and you, yeah. you order food. You spend like sixty bucks on uh you know leftover I mean, takeout, and it's just a just a sad way to live. But then when you get drunk again, you're like, Hey, this is pretty good. But then that, that hangover is a real lesson. So that's what was getting me. The drinking was fun. The hangover has really fucked my life up. So I realized if I want to get anything done, I got to cool it with the booze, but I like booze. I heard a wise man once say, I like drinking so much that I don't abuse it. And I was like, that's good. And, uh, I'm yeah, it's like the addiction that. ruins the drug. Yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. The booze. Yeah. I mean, it's a reason why it's so popular. Um, you yeah. just gotta keep it cool. It's like a cupcake. You can't eat 18 cupcakes a day, but you have a cupcake once a week. Yeah, that's kind of the the realization that I had with booze is that I was I was making my life miserable with the hangovers. Yeah, it's getting too drunk because there's a point where, you know, I, I was getting so fucked up, especially you know, first year out of college, end of college, where I wasn't even enjoying myself right, anymore. I right. was just like, I, I need to get home. Yep. Um, you know, at this point, I can't even jerk off. I got, you know, I got to wait till the next day. Too drunk for uh, for that even. And then yeah, nothing comes out. Exactly. It's so, like, <laughs> yeah, your dick is like like, like dust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got that that uh, that Gandalf dick just blown yeah. out dust. <laughs> right. Um, and then I, I started to think about alcohol and really drugs in general, you know, how can I, for me personally, how can I use alcohol to enhance whatever it is that I'm doing? Cause I, I wanted to make my experience better. So for podcasts yeah. or going out, like I'll, I'll think about it a little bit before where I'll say, okay, you know, podcasts probably going to feel good with one or two drinks. Yep. Then I got to keep this going. If, yep. I, if I'm, if I'm going out at night, how can I make alcohol a net positive in my life now now that this sounds like the opposite of an aa meeting where i'm just like yeah. talking about the positivity yes. of bringing alcohol into your life there are goods um, to it but yeah no it's it's everything is so all or nothing yeah with drugs where it's like you want to you know don't do this or, right. or this is okay and that fluctuates every few years and there's so much gray area where you can you know have a drink or two or, or you know do whatever and it's fine. It, it enhances and makes shit better. It loosens you up a little bit. And yeah. It's, it's like anything. It's like yeah. fire. Fire can co- cook your food. It can warm your house or it can burn your house down or burn you or burn down a forest or water. Water. You need water to live. You, to, you got to drink water. Water is, uh, you know, good for cleaning and whatever, but they could also be a flood. You know, it's yeah. like everything's got its ups and downs. So booze is the same way. And some people just get it out of their life completely, which I, I get it, and I think that's good for a lot of people, but I can't do that. I like it, and I, I want to. And think about how many people met their wives or husbands because of alcohol. Let's go out and get a drink. 
Yeah. You know, like I know a lot of sober people who are like, I can't get laid. I can't meet anybody because we go out for coffee. It's weird, you know, and I'm not saying you need you should need booze to meet people, but it helps. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah, so- sobriety. People talk about sobriety like it's a virtue, like, right. like being sober automatically makes you the best version of yourself. But sure. there, there are a lot of sober pieces of shit, just like there are a lot of drunk pieces of shit. And I feel like you you can modulate it to however you need to. Yes. Personally, there should be a discussion about it. Like maybe, maybe you should quit alcohol for three years. You don't, you know, you don't have to do a, a, be a lifer, but yeah. maybe you take a step back for three years and then you get back into it when you have a, a fully formed frontal lobe and yes, or maybe, you know, you cut back and I, I just feel like it's very black and white. And when it comes to alcohol, I agree. And, and what's more impressive, look, quitting alcohol is amazing. I couldn't do it. Quitting meat is amazing. I couldn't do it, but what's more impressive, uh, uh quitting or learning to deal with it responsibly. Learn, that, learning to deal with it. Yeah, sure. like you got a wild stallion and you can't tame it. You can't get on its back. It won't let you. What's more impressive is going, all right, I'll never ride a horse again no. or taming that beast. And now all of a sudden you're riding it into the sunset. So if let's say hypothetically you had to give up alcohol for the next five years, except for one situation in your life. Ooh. So for me, it would be snowboarding. I, I would oh. keep I would keep whiskey in my life snowboarding because there's nothing better than being on a lift in you know 30 <laughs> degrees you know powder underneath you and then you fucking you take a swig and you just feel the warmth of oh, whiskey going through beautiful. you while you're on the slopes like a nice buzzed run at the end of the day that is that is very special the sun is shining oh 100 it's, it's cold outside but the whiskey's warm and you just have that feeling of freedom yeah i love it it's like that uh scene in shawshank redemption where they they tar the roof, and then they, the the warden gives them a bucket of those that, ice cold golden beers. Mm, ah, yeah, it's, beautiful. It's just the the warmth coming out from inside you in that moment. Totally. It's also crazy that booze was medicine. You know, probably a hundred years ago, up till then, it was like some people would still say it is. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, like a lot of people meditate, and that's great. But this this for some people is a meditation. It's just like ah, it takes the edge off. Yeah, they should. Uh, I, I do a meditation app in the morning, so maybe they should consolidate it. Meditation, buzzed meditation, you know, for, for weekends, weekend yeah. meditations when you're trying to get crazy. Right, right. Just see what would happen. Maybe it would be a cool experience. Yeah, and I think, uh, like, I'll do a, for me, alcohol, the whole point is, or drugs in general, you don't want it to fuck with your life. So if you can enjoy it and not have it ruin aspects of your life, then you're okay. But So I have it after, if I have a good set, I can have a beer. But mm. a lot of the guys will have a beer before the set. And I'm like, ah, that's that's tricky. Because now so, you're rewarding yourself and you haven't done anything yet. So you go on completely sober and yeah. then you you use the the beer as a reward yes. if you have a good set. I exactly. like that. I like that. And you're done with work. Yeah, it went well. You're satisfied. Now I earned a beer. Yeah. So So for you, would it be if you had to quit alcohol except for one thing, one situation, would it be that post beer or post set beer? Yeah, that would be it. Or uh, because now I used to just go hard all the time, like blackout shots, all this shit. And now I do that only on vacation. So, you know, you go to Hawaii or something and you're like, all right, I'm having 12 Mai Tais. I'm going to lay in the sun. I'm going to fall asleep, wake up, do it again. So uh, and every day is a vacation. So there you go. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, there you go. Bumper sticker mentality. So it'd be either be after a set or on vacation. Those are the two times I'll go for it. You know, like you go to a friend's bachelor party and you're in, uh, you know, uh, the Virgin Islands. You're like, yeah. I got to I got to get hammered. Yeah. You, you've probably being from New Orleans. You've probably had a lot of observational bachelor party experiences, bachelorette party experiences, like just watching <laughs> oh, other, yeah. other uh, groups in their element for that weekend. That, yes. It's uh, I was just at a show at governor's club in long island sure and there was a bachelorette party there Ugh. and it was like it, it it was it turned into an actual challenge for the the comedians on stage because they they wanted to poke fun at the bachelorette party but then they wouldn't shut up mm. and as the show kept going on and on the the back and forth kept leaking into the sets yep. more and more and yep. then you know, finally, this uh, 
uh, one of the comics at the end kind of just like shut it down where he's just like, God, you're fucking annoying. And then like went into his joke, but it was funny. Like the yeah. way that he said it. Um, but it's, yeah. it's, it's the weirdest, uh, phenomenon, these bachelorette parties and bachelor parties that go to comedy clubs, because let's be honest, you're bacheloretting or bachelor partying. You want to party. You want to go out. You want to get crazy mayhem chaos. Why the fuck are you going to somewhere where you have to sit quietly and listen for an hour and a mm. half? It's the craziest idea, but it happens all the time. And nonetheless, in Levittown, New York. <laughs> yeah, right? Go to Manhattan. <laughs> they're, they're, it's yeah. 20 minutes and away. I've been at a comedy club in the city. They're in uh, Long Island. Yes. And, and look, I know it's a lot of work, but if you are looking for a comedy club where there's some interaction or something like a comedy show where there's like you can heckle and it's part of it, you got to do a little research. Because mm. you could be going to see, uh, you know, Stephen Wright, who's like a one-liner, stoic, quiet, kind of mumbly comedian, and you got to ruin the show. Yeah, maybe. So, like, I feel like when when people go on bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, they're always trying to surround the degeneracy that they're engaging <laughs> with their bodies and minds with an epic city yeah like vegas yes. or, or nashville miami so maybe levittown new york was actually a good choice because it's like you're you're surrounding the degeneracy with depravity there's literally nothing in levittown so it's like yeah. the, the inside matches the outside yeah, I don't you, know. you got a point you got a point there yeah. they might they might be onto something now you grew up in long island did yeah plain view now uh what plain is the, jew plain jew it. oh is that right yeah, plain. It's uh, mostly mostly white Jews. I'd say about seventy percent, and then South Koreans. Ah, a lot of Jews, a lot of Koreans. I feel like Jews and Koreans are similar. They're just hardworking, keep their head down. They got their culture. They stick with it. They kind of date their own. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. But Long Island. I mean, what is that like? Because everybody I meet from Long Island's a fucking just a psycho, but in a good way. It uh, it depends what part of Long Island. So I would say you got to separate it by Nassau and Suffolk County. Sure. Because Nassau is like, it's closer to the city. You'll get more upbeat psychos. Suffolk <laughs> County is more, it reminds me of upstate New York or, or a lot of places down south where everything's kind of spread out. Oh, okay. Kind of, kind of farmier. So, so it really depends. I mean, the, is to me. Is there a beef? Uh, between Nassau and Suffolk, n not really. Okay, that's good. Uh, the biggest, the biggest psychos to me growing up were probably old Jewish women. Like oh, really? I, I just standing behind them in line at a deli and, <laughs> and, li and listening to the shit that they would talk about. Like they I would listen to entire 15 minute conversations in line, just about how the Turkey isn't as good as it used to be. <laughs> and it's like, not, not the typical psycho, but it's like, it's a level of psychotic that you can only get to living in a place like yes. Long Island. Like the, 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 the right. Turkey, there's not, it's just, there's not a lot going on. So right. minimal shit like that takes up 80% of your processing power. And then you're, you're letting it out. Like you're letting the bad shit out in the form of, you know, talking about Turkey with another 85 year old woman. And it's just like, it's, it's like a cold Florida almost. I felt Ooh, like like people people are like that. people. It's people who haven't moved to Florida to die yet. Yeah, that, that want all four seasons of death. Yeah, yeah. You know what else? It it feels like people look. People in New York City are psychos too. Don't get me wrong, mm. but they're kept in check. If you're a psycho on the subway, somebody's gonna go shut the fuck up, mm. get out of here. If you're at the deli line, like who the fuck is this bitch? Shut up, mm. Karen or whatever. The people will keep you in check. Long Island, there's no check. Yeah. So you get the psycho. With no filter. Yeah. I I do I enjoy the the psycho cold honesty of the city yeah. much more, especially compared to other cities. I, I feel like the the niceness of slower cities is a is it's more brutal. fake. It's, it's more brutal. fake than it is nice. Like I know I've had so many conversations where it drags on and on and on and uh, there are a lot of people who are nice, but there are also conversations where both of us just are crying inside saying, I want to leave. Like, yes. I just, I was here to buy bacon, egg and cheese yes. and I've been here for 14 minutes. Like, can we, and in New York, it's like, what do you, why are you still stand here? Like, get the fuck out. I gave you. And so I appreciate that kind of 
quickness, I guess. I agree. I agree. I think there's more genuineness to it because mm. I grew up in Louisiana, so it's that Southern hospitality. I guarantee. I do declare. <laughs> but that shit, it's like we were saying with the clean comic. If you always have this nice, hospitable face on, you got to get it out somewhere, which is why we drink hard, why we party hard, why we hunt, why we uh, have rebel flags. You know, we got to get it out somewhere. And that's, that's, I think that's what life's all about is this balance. Yeah. So if you go hard one way, you got to go hard the other. Speaking of drinking hard, let me, uh, yeah, there you go. Let me drink a little bit harder. Yeah. I go back to New Orleans and, uh, just getting a cup of coffee. You're like, come on. I know it's the South and we're all fat and sweaty, but like, uh, I got yeah. shit to do. I, I did have a good conversation, uh, with one of my waiters cause we, both realized that our table was next to a, a heroin needle, right, uh, right on the sidewalk, and it became like a, a running joke whenever you come fun. back to the table. Yeah, and he took a picture of it. It was, you know, it was a, it was a good time. Um, that was in New Orleans. That was in New Orleans. Yeah. There you go. Nice breakfast joint. So, going back to drinking, or I guess we never left. Uh, continuing with drinking. Sure. I'd like to read you. Norm McDonald's pre-show routine, according to his book, based on a true story, which I just finished. It's great. Great. Awesome book. I read it right when it came out, so it's yeah. been a little bit. Yeah, and, and and suspend your disbelief. You know, this could all be yeah. real, could be made up. Probably, probably a mix of both, but either way, that's not the point. It's uh, just take from it what you will. Okay, yeah, it's very entertaining. It's mm -hmm. kind of this Hunter S. Thompson-esque uh, trip about of, of comedy, the comedy world. 100%. So Norm Macdonald writes about his uh, pre-show routine. Then it is time for my body. I stretch, beginning with my calves, and then without hurry, I add to the stretch so that it spreads all the way up my body and finishes with the neck. Very important, the neck. Uh, this is crucial since I hold most of my stress in my neck. I make sure each stretch is slow and deliberate as I perform the stretches I listen through the headphones to the calming strumming of the zither, mm. the most relaxing of all instruments. With my mind in a state of cheerful slack and my body loosed, it is then time to work on my soul. Mm. I take out two six milligram bars of Xanax and ah. I slowly swallow them. And then I reach into my back pocket to find my flask, which is always filled with Wild Turkey 101. I upend it into my mouth, and then I drink until I have to stop to gasp for breath. Then I vomit. Then I close my eyes and think about the dog and the stream and all that shit. And then I end my pre-show routine by punching my agent in the stomach. <laughs> that's hilarious. Classic. Man, that's so great. That was beautifully written. It's a, do you, uh, you want to take any ideas there from that pre-show routine? What's your what's your pre-show routine well, like? Any uh, any crossover? He's obviously bullshitting and being funny, yeah. but uh, he has a f he Norm has a th I'm obsessed with Norm, and he has a thing with uh, punching people in the stomach. He just thinks that's so funny. Yeah, I don't know if you saw Dirty Work, but uh, the landlord would be like, "If you don't pay rent, I will punch you in the it's, stomach." It's so something I need to watch. Oh, and I have it. I know it's a sin. It. Yeah, I know. I know it's a sin. It's it's so funny. It's so off the wall and ridiculous, but it's hilarious, and it really lets Norm. Shine shine is norm yeah and a young fat Artie lang is fun yeah. but uh yeah i think that's great he's kind of obviously mocking these these weirdo pretentious queefs who uh have like a zen fountain and stretch and do mm -hmm. shadow boxing or push-ups before they tell dick jokes in, yeah. in cleveland but uh yeah that's great that's hilarious but for me i don't have anything i like to look at my notes a little i prefer to get a shower in i like to shower before a show just hot so or cold Cold, hot, psycho, hot, hot. No, hot. There you go. I did the cold thing for ten minutes, and I go ah. ten minutes. I mean, I did it for like a second in my life. Okay, and, there you uh, go. It was. I, I guess I'm not disciplined enough. I couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I it's, get it's it. like a it's like a thirty second annoying yeah. coffee that you have to tell everyone else about that yeah. you did, <laughs> and I did it. Like I still do. I still enjoy cold showers. You really? When I when I first started doing it, I was like, I you know. I need to tell people about this, you know, five seconds after you get out of the shower, like I got a tweet about cold showers and I was like, yeah. all right, I'll calm down. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They always have to tell you. <laughs> yeah. But I, somebody I know does the cold plunge where they jump in a pool and I'm like mm. that I would prefer because the shower takes the, it's actually harder because you have to do it yourself. You yeah. know, you got to have enough discipline, to not only take the cold, but turn it on. So, yeah. uh, the cold plunge I would prefer, but yeah, I feel like they're, 
obviously this, you know, this, this could be completely made up some truth to it from Norm, but the, the sentiment I would guess is pretty accurate where you have some semi-serious stuff that you do before sure. you go on stage. Maybe you have five minutes to yourself in the green room or something. You, you do a quick meditation and then you're right, like, all right, enough of this serious bullshit. I'm going to have a beer, take yeah. a shot, right. you know, start, start talking to my friends before get in that cheerful mood. So it's like a good, when I was reading it, I thought, you know, it's ridiculous, but it's also a good combination of the, like the life hack industry, yeah, like, like yeah, kind of exactly. making fun of like, you know, if you're, you know, if you're not taking uh cold dips and, right. and uh, putting butter in your coffee, like, are you even alive, man? And yeah. <laughs> then like, you're also saying, okay, take a step back. Let me, let me just be a human being for a little bit before I get on stage. Totally. Totally. He's, yeah. he's definitely right. I think you nailed it on the head. Yeah. I think you got the joke. All right. So what's something that's special about the New York comedy scene that Ooh. you can't get in LA or other cities? Something that when you're in New York, you know, when I do three or four spots tonight, this is going to be something unique about that experience. I hate to say it because you, you, you don't want to be that guy who just trashes LA, but there is a difference. I think, and look, there's a couple LA guys and gals who, who really work on the joke. They care about the joke itself. What's the thing I'm working on? Like I saw Gaffigan last night at Gotham. He's got a mm. binder. He's got notes. He's like, I'm coming here to tweak and work out material. Whereas in LA, I feel like it's very, hey guys, I'm here. You're lucky I'm here. I'm kind of a celebrity. Let me bullshit with you for a minute. I'll say, I can tell myself I got on stage, I did the work, and then I'm going home in my mm. nice apartment or my nice house. LA, in New York, I feel like you come to the club to get work done. Yeah. And in LA, I feel like you go to the club, you schmooze. And look, I, I'm, I'm with, with generalizing. Not everyone does this, but I think most of LA. So I think in New York, it's all about making the perfect joke, making the joke better. Where in LA, it's more like, I, I'm a presence. I'm here. I'll kill or I won't kill, but I'm, I'm going to be me. And you guys, you guys get on board or not get on board. Does that make sense? I feel yeah. Like it's, it's like the, like New York is more about the grittiness of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And then LA may still have that, but there's more schmoozing. Involved. Yes. There, there's more it's more influencing, of an appearance. appearing. Yeah, it's yeah. like a big, uh, like, who's who. And, yeah. and New, <laughs> yeah. New York, uh, uh, you know, I feel like guys like, you know, uh, like David Tell, for example, he's just, like, quick in and out doing work. And, like, I'm going to go back to my life now. Exactly. Like, David Tell shows up at midnight. He smokes eight cigarettes. He's got 12 jokes on Prince Andrew, three <laughs> on Patton Oswalt, and then he goes home. And he's, like, yeah. he's he's working, you know, where in L.A. it's, like, it's more of a... Hey, I'm I'm out. I'm doing stuff. Look at me. Take a photo. It's more of like a cameo. So so that night you were there with Jim Gaffigan. You said he was working off of notes, and then you were more casual. You were kind of just seeing what worked off the top, or were, were you also using notes? I had to go after him, but I was using notes too. Yeah. And look, you got your tried and true, but then you sandwich that around the mm. shit that works. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like he's he's a celebrity, so he can go up and really like they know they trust him already. It's like you said earlier. They know who yeah. he is. They know he's funny. They know he's good. So he can bounce off of them a lot more. Whereas I have to like go up and kill, earn their trust, then try new, lose them, get them back with shit that works. Yeah. It's like, uh, if, if you're coming in with a celebrity status, then you have that extra, maybe minute or two of mutual trust oh, yeah. oh, before yeah. if you're, if, and if you're not funny, then everything levels out but yeah. you get you get a little boost i'm sure, sure when, when sure. you go on stage but it still has to be funny it still has to be funny yeah and he did go he went through that part too where he wasn't known and he earned it and yada yada yeah so he he did it the right way he did, and he's a great comic and uh he had good stuff yeah I, it, it's funny i i just i watched his special last night and it's hilarious jim gaffigan the, the new one on netflix comedy monster yeah and uh, Out to Lunch, available on YouTube. Hey, hey. Also fucking hilarious. Thank go, you, thank go you. Go check it out. 9.2 9. million views. Just yeah, saying. and climbing. Oh, yeah. We're trying to get to 10. There you go. Someone, someone's got to buy that. 
I feel like someone's got to make an offer. You think it's been out there over a year? Maybe. All right. I mean, it doesn't even matter. This I'll, I'll I'll buy it right now. All right. I got a, I got another bottle of whiskey for you. I'll, I'll uh that'll break do it. it out. Um, but so I actually saw I saw you, Jim Gaffigan, Taylor Tomlinson. I think it was Al Franken at Gotham. Maybe oh, like three yeah. three months ago, four that. months ago. It was right right show. before I went to New Orleans. So probably beginning of October. And it, it's it's funny because that show, uh, you also had notes yeah i saw you were working on the side with some notes seeing what worked and jim gaffigan was more off the top because uh, he, he mentioned something towards the end of the set he was like i i don't know if you guys could tell but i'm working this shit out yeah, you know? yeah. and it was still hilarious but it's just kind of funny to see the progression and, and dynamic of jim gaffigan getting on stage working things out trying to see what works what doesn't and then you know watch his special I, at that point he already filmed it but I, right. I, I hadn't seen it yet and watch his special i'm like oh that shit yes you, you spruce it up you, you, right you try it 400 times exactly and, um now let me ask you you're a non-comedian you're an audience member mm. you're you don't write jokes when you see a guy go up there with notes and and trying stuff, is that a bummer? Like, hey, what the fuck? I want the real product. Or is it like, whoa, this is kind of cool. I'm seeing the process. No, it's not a bummer at all. I I am fascinated by the process of people telling jokes. Like, I'm a huge fan of comedy. I watch comedy on my lunch breaks. So I'll just wow. type in someone's name in the search bar on YouTube, and I'll just watch, like, Laugh Planet love those compilation videos where it just has a bunch of comics in one and oh yeah i i appreciate seeing comedians try shit whether it works or not <laughs> and the extra it, i feel like it almost humanizes it oh because sure. I, I feel like in a way i can relate to them better because i think of myself having notes on a podcast and make writing that first draft of it and being like, oh, this question's kind of good. This one's dumb as fuck. Let me right. kind of thinking in my head how this is going to go. And so to see someone at that level on stage where they're, they're telling it in person to dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of people and knowing that I was there for that point in time yeah. where they worked on that joke and, you know, it's Mark Norman and he, he's telling a joke and, and he has notes written out on his pad and he goes back and you made a comment about one of the jokes where you said like that worked or, and then another one you said, oh, that one needs work. Yeah. And then to see that on the next special, right. I, I'm going to think back to that moment and be like, holy fuck, I was there the night he was trying that joke early right, on so right, to right. me I, to me i enjoy that i i, I love seeing right. the progression of it but you're also a comedy fan so i wonder if there's some guy from you know jersey who's like i drove in for this and you're fucking working out i'm paying you know 60 bucks and i gotta watch you tell me half-baked shit yeah but pe people are people are coming for you they're, they're not necessarily coming for finished jokes i don't I, know I, I, I hope you're right i i think but what I if think, they don't know me I think w someone like you, when you're at the point where you can, you can riff off the top right. and baseline be funny. You could, you, I'm sure you can make up a new five minutes tonight and then go on stage and do pretty well with five know. minutes that you just wrote tonight. And, and some nights might be better. Some nights sure. might be a little bit, uh, might need a little bit more work, but you're baseline funny and you've put in the work to do that. Mm. And so someone in the audience, they're going to get, funny no matter what it, it okay. might be more polished it might be more raw but I, I think as an audience member most people appreciate the spectrum between raw and polished and, and they don't feel like they got robbed with the rawness all right i don't right. feel like most people when they <laughs> when they get done raw they don't feel like they've got robbed that's, yeah that's how i feel okay like. that's a good way to put it i've had a lot of shows where i've uh tried some new shit or had an interaction with the crowd and i've I get off stage and I shake hands or take photos and people go like, when you did that thing with that guy and the, the crowd, that was amazing. And I was like, it's cool to hear, but the party kind of dies because you're like, well, you know, I worked on that toothpaste joke for six months and finally got it to work. But that's yeah. the part that sticks out. But that, yeah. I guess it's just, that's the breaks. Yeah. And you're, you're going to work on it no matter what. So I, I feel like if, if you are going up there 
and you know to be cliche you're trying your best and you're you're figuring out what shit works what shit doesn't that's what's gonna make it a good comedy show i feel like people they don't need super polished things they they need something that a comic is working on and different jokes in that set will be at different levels of polish uh-huh. but, I, but i don't think the shit that's uh more unpolished takes away from the the audience experience at least I, okay I, i'm just talking as an audience member i'll take it yeah i'll take it good to know so uh apparently this is something I, I was just reading that there are a lot of la porn stars getting into comedy is that right a lot of crossover porn stars getting into comedy and uh there, there's one comic uh sovereign sire out in la she she uh ha, what she, she yeah sovereign sire um, sounds like she, a Game of Thrones lady or something. She could. I, I haven't checked out her porn yet, but maybe she uh, puts on some some nice Game of Thrones costumes. Sure. Um, she she was talking about how in porn there's like this nakedness, vulnerability aspect to it, where you're you're bearing yourself in front of an audience, and then you're also telling jokes and comedy. I think she's done like six hundred sets or something. And said that there's like this vulnerability aspect that she can feel between a porn set and a comedy <laughs> set. So I wanted to ask you, do you ever do you ever feel obviously it's different if you're not a porn star, but do you ever feel like there's a connection between the vulnerability of you getting naked in front of a person that you barely know and the vulnerability of telling a new joke in front of someone most people that you barely know in an audience because there is like i'm trying this shit out for yeah. both of them for a little bit like you're gonna see if you're vibing with me right i'm gonna see if i'm vibing with you yeah i i think it's different i think a stripper is more like a comedian but the only way a porn star is like a comedian to me is the fucked up background mm-hmm. you know like you have to have some trauma to get you into this job whether it's comedy or porn i don't think porn is similar to comedy because comedy you're creating it's all like your point of view your Mm. thoughts that came out of thin air now you have to construct them in a way that's palatable and funny and in 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 sit in elicits involuntary laughter Mm. whereas a porn star is like i'll blow this guy i'll lick his ass i'll lick his balls it's all all the moves are done you know like how creative can you really be as a porn star i'll lick his ass while i'm upside down i'll lick his ass while i have a viking hat on you know like so I think if a porn star is hot, I think if she's a great actress and good at fucking, I think you're going to be fine. Yeah, we'll see. But a comic has to, man or woman, has to come up with original ideas and make sure they make audiences laugh. They have to seem confident. They have to write new material, more material, kill for a certain amount of time. So I, I don't think you can compare the two. But so, so stripper, background. you feel like a, a stripper may be more similar to well, it's like live. In, in terms it, of the vulnerability. Yeah, yeah you're working shit out. You you're got, working shit out. It's in front of an audience. You're you're working for tips. You gotta the tips are like the laughs. Like, oh wow, she did a fucking uh, handstand and her tits fell on her face and she licked <laughs> one of them. Here's a buck. Yeah, you know, like that's a laugh. So I think strippers are. I would compare more to comics than porn star. Porn yeah. star, it's all set up for you. There's a camera. There's a director. There's an actor. There's a craft services. Porn porn star is like a special, and strippers like you're working out working out yeah. a set. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. There you yeah, go. you're like uh, making stuff clap on the pole. You're seeing what works from the you know the businessman but also like the creepy guy maybe you see a couple so you're like oh this worked in this crowd but like yeah. uh, i was in atlanta and that didn't work but in new york that killed so you're, exactly. you're going back and you're you're analyzing your stripper set so yeah yeah and also porn is already labeled as like this naughty thing whereas comedy can be clean comedy can be dirty comedy can be informative i, I don't know i think i don't know i think uh, porn is I'm not, look, I'd like to, I'm I'm sure there's some porn star right now waving a butt plug in anger, you know, (laughs) what the fuck? But, uh, I don't know, talk, call me, porn star, let's talk about it. Yeah, that would be uh, a a great We Might Be Drunk podcast, have a porn star on that's doing comedy. I would love that. Play Well, it's open invitation there, uh, Sovereign. Sovereign Sire, yeah. uh, Sriracha, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. come (laughs) on in, we'd love to have you. Sovereign Sire using the Sriracha, there we go. Oh, spice things up. I think Drake did that recently. (laughs) Did he? He put hot sauce in a condom, and a girl poured this shit from the condom inside of her clam, and she burned. 
Oh. You didn't hear this? No. Oh, I'll send you no. a link. Yeah, that's, uh, it seems like that's uh, a terrible experience for Drake. I feel like if the girl is pouring her shit in there, she's not really having to deal with the shit, but then Drake has the spiciness of the yeah. sriracha <laughs> yeah. and the smell and, and feel of the shit. So he's, uh, but I, I can't wait for the, the next album. That's what I'll say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so do you, do you have a a favorite, a quote unquote favorite bombing experience to talk about? Like, I'm sure, mm. you know, I don't know what that feels like to bomb on stage. And, and I'm sure it's, you know, dreadful it's and brutal. You learn shit, but also it's like it fucking sucks. I'm sure. Yeah. But do you have one that you look back on and you're like, oh, it's kind of like my favorite bomb like it's it's what it was bad but also you know something about it stuck out to you well the one that i've bombed millions of times but the one that hurt the most was uh kalamazoo michigan whatever the the arena is there it's like a hockey arena or whatever it is Twenty thousand people i'm opening for schumer she's a huge star superstar she's nice enough to let me open she's uh sold out the place I look out in the crowd. It's it's just me and then her. I do 20 minutes and I bring her on and that's the show. And it's all like camo hats and a lot of dip and a lot of mm. sleeveless and a lot of flannel. And I'm like, whatever. But before I go on, she goes, you know what? I'm going to produce your Comedy Central Hour. And I'm like, this is 2015. I'm like, oh yeah. my God, Comedy Central Hour. I've got nothing going on in my life. This is huge. Thank you. You're the best. You're such a, a great friend and so nice. Mm -hmm. And you're using your power to help me. What a, but she goes, she's usually like so busy that she would sit in the green room and I would do a set and she would work on her notes or do her stuff. And then I would bring her on and she would kill. So she goes, but tonight, since I'm giving you this hour, I want to watch, see what kind of material you're doing, you know, for, so I can, you know, have a sense of it for TV. So I was like, all right, great. So it's been going great. It's a great tour. But for some reason, knowing she was there, she's sitting on the side of the stage. It's a giant mm. arena. I go up first. I go up pretty cold. And I'm doing 20 minutes in front of her, in front of the crowd. And I eat shit. First joke bombs. Mm. Second joke bomb. This is 20,000 people. Yeah. The silence of 20,000 people is deafening is, it's is a it, piercing feeling is it actual silence or is it dulled laughter because i i've been to shows where i've i've listened to some podcasts where comedians talk about bombing after the fact and i've been in the show and i wouldn't describe what they just did as bombing uh -huh. so do you, <laughs> like do you to you is it it does is bombing the laughter isn't to your expectation or is bombing it's just, it couldn't hear shit. Like, was it actually pretty deafening? It was deafening, pretty, pretty silence? bad, pretty yeah. quiet. And you could hear like a, <laughs> every now oh, and then, or like a. Pre-COVID. So yeah, no one was freaked yeah, out. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or there would be like a, a guy, I, I think I'm sitting here. I think I'm sitting, oh, sorry, sorry. I thought this was yeah. my seat. You hear a little of that or like, where are our seats? You know, you see yeah. people walking around because it's 20,000 people in a giant arena. And she's sitting there and I can tell she's like, I'm just offering this guy a special with my name on it and look this is what he's doing and i've been killing all tour and i was like this is the one and on my back the sweat running down my back is collecting in my asshole and uh, I'm, I'm soaking wet and i i made the mistake it's kalamazoo michigan i'm a new york comedian i thought in my head like oh i'll open with the stuff i'm going to open the special with which is like this whole mm -hmm. therapy chunk anxiety chunk they don't fucking go to therapy. They don't know about, they don't have a, they, they call a guy with anxiety. What are you gay or whatever? Yeah. So I opened, I should have just played it, played to the crowd, but I opened with the stuff I thought I'd open the special with. And that was a huge mistake. And right after the anxiety opener, they were just like, fuck this guy. They checked out and they're like, who is he by the way? Where's, where's Amy? We came to see, who's this guy? He's still on Jesus Christ. And it was brutal. And I walked off. I was traumatized. I was like shaking. Yeah. So, so you, you went with your, you didn't go with your gut. And, yes. And that ended up caught, that ended up resulting in the bomb. Yeah, I think so. Completely. So now at this point in your comedy career, will you, when you have that gut feeling again, will you scrap something? If you just have an inkling that uh, like, I don't think the city is going to take this. I, I had this 
five minutes prepared to start off first, I'm going to scrap it and go with something else. You listen to your gut more now because of that experience. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I should have played it safe instead of being like, I was stubborn. I was like, I got this anxiety stuff. It works. They'll get it. It's an arena. They're here for comedy. It'll be fine. I should have just been like, no, no, they don't know who you are. They hate you. You suck. You're in the way of the show of the headliner. Win them over. I should have had more lower self-esteem. Yeah. Is is Malcolm Gladwell the one that writes about uh like gut feeling thinking in the moment? I'm trying I'm trying to remember where I heard this, but uh He's got the tipping point. Tipping point. It might have been uh old Malcolm there, but he whoever it was, they they were writing about when you should listen to your gut feeling. Ah. And the the premise was if you have experience in a certain area like if, you, if you've been doing comedy for five ten plus years you have built up this database of instinct and thousands of experiences where you're calling upon regardless if you realize it or not mm. so when you're in the moment and you have a gut feeling about your expertise you should always listen to that gut feeling even if you don't realize wow. where it's coming from but in shit, like, I don't know, I, I barely know how to change a tire. So if I had a gut feeling, like, maybe I should use uh, this fucking uh, crowbar on the side of the road for a wrench because I don't have one. Don't listen to that mm. feeling because I haven't done it before. But always, always go with your uh, gut feeling when you've built up the the repertoire. Cause, yeah. Because you don't even realize those fucking neurons, whatever's happening in your brain are just connecting all and going like, this is like, yes. this is the thing. This is the thing I've, you've done this 5,000 times before. And like, yep. it's all culminating yep. in this one feeling of I should go right or I should go left. And you're like, I kind of feel like I should go left, go left. Uh, I think that's completely dead on. Like, do you yeah. hear that this lady got pushed on the tracks yesterday? Do you hear about that? No. Yeah. Some guy just pushed an old or a, not old, but she was a Chinese lady or Asian lady, pushed her right on the tracks. Train came. She got hit. She died. And it's Jesus. this big New York story. And he tried to do it to a woman earlier and she got out of there and like finagled her way out. And then he went to the other lady and pushed her. And uh, I think that first lady was like, something's up with this guy. I'm going yeah. with my gut. And I think the second lady probably had a gut feeling, but she's like, I don't want to be presumptuous. People are good. I'm not racist, whatever it is. And she stayed there and she got pushed. So the, the first lady, she had those, you know, 10,000 reps of creep, yes. creeps being around yes. her in the subway. Spidey sense. Yeah, and she probably, a couple guys before that were like, maybe they didn't try to push her, but she got that feeling, you know, maybe this guy's going to whip his dick out or something. And something. She, got, she got that vibe, and then the the second lady just didn't trust her gut. Yeah. Should have read Malcolm. Should have read Malcolm. Yeah. Now, so, Malcolm in the, the middle of the tracks now. Hey, there, there you go. There you go. There it is, folks. Clip yeah. it. Yep. <laughs> um... So you mentioned at the end of a recent podcast on We Might Be Drunk, you mentioned uh, an experience involving fentanyl. Yeah. I don't know if, if you've told a story about that, but I, I just heard you and Sam kind of, it, it, it was at the end of an episode. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you what, like, did you almost Mac Miller yourself? What happened? Is Can that what happened to him? Mac Miller, yeah, overdosed. It was a combination of cocaine, fentanyl, and some other drug. But I think he probably did cocaine with fentanyl in it and didn't realize the fentanyl was in there. Whoa. The yeah. fentanyl, we, we were so up our own ass about the vaccine. It's like, hey, fentanyl is killing, like, way more people. Oh, yeah. And nobody seems to give a fuck. But, yeah, I, uh, I had trouble sleeping I still do, but I was really like getting like an hour of sleep every night and I was starting to go nuts. And I had this gig in Texas and I, the opener will text you and be like, Hey, I'm opening for you. I, I run this town, anything you need, you need booze, you need Coke, you need drugs, you need whatever I got. it. I was like, well, if you can get some Xanax, I'm having trouble mm. sleeping. He's like, I'm an ex addict. I know the guy I got gotcha. you. Mm. So he was trying to be super cool. And he got me these crazy Xanax called green hulks. They're mm. like these tall, skinny things, and they're called Green Hulk, and that's what the street name, but they're crazy Xanax. Like, what do you call Are it? they actually green, or do they look they're like green. white? Okay. They're green, and they're, they look like totem poles. Mm. And he gave it to me, and I was like, oh, great, all right. And I'm such an idiot. I don't know anything about drugs. That the night, one night, I was like, I really want to get some sleep. We drank all night. 
And we had all these big plans to go. We're going to go tubing in the morning. There's these hot springs. We're going to wake up early, go tubing. We'll be hungover, but we'll have some drinks on the tube. It'll be a great day. I was like, great. Went home. Want to get some sleep for the tubing. Pop the whole thing. Apparently, you're supposed to break them up. Yeah. Pop the whole thing. And whole I, I slept for 25 hours. I fell asleep in the lobby. I got kicked out of the hotel because they're like, hey, you only had one room, mm. like one night. So they pulled me out of the hotel, and I just fell asleep in the lobby. And it was such a shitbox hotel that they let me sleep in the lobby because it was just like there was probably a crackhead next to me. And my friend was calling me all day like, hey, I'm ready to tube. Hey, we got mm. a show tonight. Hey, where are you? Hey, hey. So he showed up at the hotel, and here I am asleep in the lobby. And he's like, what the fuck is going on? So he's shaking me. And I won't wake up. He's dragging me around. My feet are dragging. And he calls my, my girlfriend. He called my agent. He's like, I don't know what's up with this guy. He's fucked up. So he said, let me call one of these IV places. Mm. And this lady was like a nurse also. She came over, gave me an IV, and I kind of started coming back to life. But I am fucked out of my mind. And she's like, this looks like a fentanyl thing. And yeah. uh, still did the show that night. But yeah. There you go. Yeah. So so did she test you or anything? Or was she, she looked at the symptoms and she said, you know, this is this is classic Fetty Wap, yeah, did, it was. Did the, the the symptoms. I don't. There was no test, but I, I had to get a crazy IV pumped into me, and uh, I was wobbly for like two days after. Yeah, I was I was reading about uh, fentanyl being put in cocaine. Yeah, because that just didn't make sense to me. And you know, the the few times that I've engaged in the devil's powder, it's been you know in the back of my mind where I'm just like, oh, is is this gonna be it? Um. But I, I was I was looking into it online, and apparently, according to this person, th there are warring cartels, obviously, in Mexico, where wherever the the coke is coming from, and if you're a dealer, it's not in your best interest to yeah. give your Kill client your a clients. bad product. You want repeat business. Sure. It would be like if you gave a comedy if you were doing a comedy set and then you you shot your audience exactly. in the head right after, you'd be like. See ya, like no repeat business. Right. You, you want those people coming back. So I was reading that uh, warring cartels will uh. will uh, contaminate the other one's supply unknowingly, and they'll mm. sneak the fentanyl into the cocaine, and then the one cartel will think that they're you know shipping out good shit. And then the other one knows that, all right, we put there however many uh, grams in in this Coke and it's getting shipped to the U.S. and, and people are going to die or, or at least get, you know, have a bad experience. And uh, then they'll stop going to that dealer and right. maybe, maybe go to the other one. So that's that that was this uh, this lad's lad's perspective. But I thought it was, makes sense. I've always thought about it because it's like, why would someone contaminate? the product willingly exactly because you want that person to come back but you know uh there's shit behind the scenes that you don't even realize is going on it's, it's scary it's scary yeah. shit and fentanyl is so addictive that uh people will be like i need more so if you give them a little they'll come back but then people overdo it did you did you feel like something was wrong right away when you took it like like no sense something or you kind of just, just passed out and woke knocked up? me out and uh i was already drunk too when we went out drinking pretty hard and then I took one. I was like, I'm going to sleep like a baby and sleep off this hangover and tube it up. Yeah. And boom, woke up like to my friend shaking me hours yeah. and hours later. Well, d definitely, you know, we need, we need you with us for, uh, for the long haul. So definitely d don't buy those, uh, those Hulk bars uh, off Never. the street. Get, get the, get the legit stuff. It's worth yeah. it. Yeah. If you got any Xanax, please hook me up. Oh yeah. That's it, part of my gift. Yeah. Oh, After great. That, yeah. Like, All I right. bought the backpack for you. There we go. Um, <laughs> That's a lot of Xanax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was shaking around. Um, so, you know, speaking of death and, and people being pushed onto tracks, if there was a Squid Game style comedy competition. So did you, did you watch Squid Game? Uh, yeah, I did. It was so, fun. So six rounds, you know, one round is you got to write the best jokes. Second round is you got to crush on a podcast. Third round is you got to do, uh, you know, a tight. 15 got to got to got to win each round and there's 300 comedians mashed into one squid game besides yourself who do you think would make it to the final episode which two comedians Ooh. do you think would make it to the final two episodes of a comedy style squid game so writing 
you know, podcast, uh, <laughs> performing, uh, you know, green room conversation. Some guy that doesn't want to make you kill yourself in the green room. Like they sure. got, they got the whole, they got the whole package. Which two comics besides yourself, yourself, you think would make it? That's a great question. Uh, Cause a lot of comics are great at one thing, but not another, you know? So uh, like great writers maybe are on a podcast. They're kind of boring and yeah. vice versa. Some comics are kill on podcasts and their act sucks. Mm. So I would say Bill Burr. I mean, the guy is just great. He's a great comic, obviously. And then on a microphone, on a pod, he's hilarious. He does his own pod and it's, it's entertaining. It's yeah. just him in a room. And, and it's, it's still it's great. Him by himself, right? He just yeah. rants. Yeah. And it's still, and then he goes on other pods and he's great. And uh, he's, he's contrarian and he's got good points and he's funny and he's energetic. He brings it, you know? So uh, he'd be one for sure. He would yeah. last. He's very scrappy and wiry and he can find, he can, he figures out a way in. Yeah. He, he's like Norm MacDonald in the sense that he clearly prepares for his late night appearances, uh, like when he's act, an actual guest on the couch, but yeah. it comes off as he's just telling a story. Right. And it's like this, this back and forth dynamic. And he, so that would be another category. You know, you got a, you got a crush on Conan, which you've had great Conan sets. So oh, you, you'd be in there. It, who else besides uh, Bill Burr do you think would make it to that final episode? Well, I would say David Tell, but uh, he can be, he, sometimes he can be hard to, uh, to hang with because he's, he's like a squirrely mm. guy, you know, he's a brilliant comic, you know, but he's a little, he's a little uh, fidgety. So you, you think for, let's say the, the fourth game would be, you have to go out and hang out with other comics after a show and not be awkward, not, yeah. not make other kind like you, you don't think he would make it through that round. Yeah, well, he's an awkward guy. I mean, I, I love him to death, and yeah. I'm a fan, but uh, he's awkward. I think most comics are we're in our heads, we're weird. All right, so David Tell's out. Who's replacing David Tell? That's tough. I want to say Greg Giraldo, but he's dead, so he might not last that long. Yeah. He's already dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm we could bring to him think. back just for Squid Game. All right, all right. Well, uh, let me think. Gaffigan's pretty great. Uh, who else? I mean, Norm is up there. Norm's yeah. a great hang. Sweet guy. Podcasts are amazing. I still watch all his content and Full his stand up was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He had a great one on uh Howard Stern. I I'm sure he's done a bunch on Howard Stern, but there's one on, on SoundCloud that you can listen to yeah. publicly with Norm. That's great. Great stuff. Seinfeld is also a good comic yeah. and he's on Stern a bunch and it's always captivating. He's not really slinging jokes all day, but yeah. he's super cap and I've hung out with him and he's a yeah. great hang. What's what's something that surprised you about Seinfeld? Something that if you didn't hang out with Seinfeld, you wouldn't realize about him. Well, we do this thing where we put everybody up on a pedestal because they're famous and he's a household name, but he's so normal. He's like yeah. wildly normal. And to the point where you're like, this guy's kind of a dick, huh? And you're like, no, no, he's the same as me. But you just assume because he's rich and famous and a, and a sitcom star that he's going to be like rainbows and cupcakes, but he's a, he's a normal guy. He's a Long yeah. Island guy who likes baseball and cars and comedy. And he doesn't want to do shit he doesn't want to do. And uh, yeah. he's got depression. Like, he's just a normal dude. And uh, that was wildly surprising. Yeah. He's more normal than I am. Yeah, but I, uh, when I think of Seinfeld, you know, besides his comedy, I, I think of this clip where, He's he's getting off a bike or something yeah, in the city. I love that clip. And some guy goes up to him and do, doesn't he asks him some bullshit question. I I forget yeah. what the, the exact question was, but it's like, you know, yeah, what are you too. doing? Like he he's like, What are what are you doing? Why are you here? And uh he's like, you know, I'm I I work. Like I'm I'm getting work, I'm I'm putting my work in. And he's like, Well, you're a billionaire. Why do you do what what are you doing here? Like you don't have to do this right now. He's like, Does that mean I don't work i just you know <laughs> paraphrasing but he's like i basically just pack it in and, and sit slide in my coffin and like that's it just because i made a lot of money and totally yeah he, he the guy rolls up on a on a simo rolls up on a bicycle he's got the helmet on yeah. the glasses and the guy goes jerry you can tell he has this prepared yeah. line and jerry goes that was it like you tmz get, or yeah, something, yeah he's like you get one shot with me and that was your fucking question like come on dude you gotta bring you gotta come better than that and it was so it was such a great zing because the guy was so defeated. It was a great way to shut the guy down in one sentence. Yeah. So speaking of uh, billionaires, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, we will all slowly slip into the metaverse, whether we realize it or not. What do you think 
w w will you embrace comedy in the metaverse, like augmented reality, where you put on a VR set and maybe you're in New York, but you're doing a set in LA and it feels like a three dimensional view of, of people in the audience. It's not just zoom comedy, but let's say they get so good that they get rid of the delay. It feels like laughter in real time mm. to, to you. It feels like jokes in real time to the audience. And you're, you're saying it through this augmented reality headset in the metaverse. Will you embrace that type of comedy? Like it's the new thing. And you know, I'm just the old guy who doesn't understand right. it. Like me, I, I don't get a lot of it either. Or uh, we kind of go towards more. I'm, I'm only going to do in-person sets, you know, metaverse, metaverse, not for me. I mean, what do you I hate think it'll to, be like? I hate to be the old curmudgeon, but I'll try it. I mean, it's fascinating and, and impressive, but uh, I don't know. I just don't think it's going to have the same spark. I mean, you could say I would ask the same thing about sex. They got this metaverse sex. Would you do it? You go, oh, yeah, I'd try it, but I don't think it'll be the same as a penis penetrating yeah. a warm, wet vagina. Feels yeah. like that's going to be hard to replicate. The breath, the body heat, the moans. I don't know. Yeah. You, you need all that extra shit that we, we take for granted. Yeah, it, it would. Maybe the, the metaverse sex would get rid of some of the awkward post conversation because you could always fake a, that's true. a connection issue that's You're true. like oh, i came like uh, it's buffering and then you just log out and, yeah and you're fine you know what's gonna happen eventually we're gonna have all this crazy technology this is in like 50 years crazy technology and you're gonna have this group of weirdos who are like we like it the original way and that's gonna be cool to mm. do it the you, know, like, you notice a lot of we're so advanced on our phones and everything that a lot of the shit that goes viral is the most basic shit because mm. we tend to keep going back there Western movies, Westerns are popular again because it's just a guy yeah. out on the range with a shotgun and a horse. Yeah. We crave that, you know, because we're so up our own ass on social media and Amazon and Uber. So uh, I think we just tend to go hard one way, then we go back. It's like hair yeah. metal, then goes to grunge. Yeah. Then goes to hip hop. It just keeps changing. And I think that's what's going to be like with technology. Yeah. I've, I've thought about that. Like, will, when the metaverse gets good and performing in virtual reality augmented reality is new people will embrace it i'm sure because it, it, it's it's going to be addictive that that's what facebook does instagram yeah. does but then will there be a point maybe five ten years down the line where people get nostalgic and they're like i want to do a podcast in person again i want to i want to uh see a concert in person again. maybe they've seen their last 20 yeah. concerts in augmented reality exactly yeah it's going to come back yeah so so I wanted to end off on Mark Norman's guide to being happy. Ooh. If you were to gift your 18-year-old self with what you know now, Mark Norman's guide to being happy, what would be the top two rules in that guide? Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. All right. I think uh, one, I'd probably cool it with the booze, and find... <laughs> Find out who your real friends are. You know, don't waste a lot of time with, uh, look, it's cool to have acquaintances and, and associates and, and, you know, buddies, but find out who the real friends are and stick with them and spend a lot of time with them. And don't waste a lot of time with uh, fluffy people you just kind of come in contact with. Be nice. Always be gracious and uh, diplomatic. But I think find those real people in your life and, and hang out with them more and absorb them more. Uh, and, uh, don't worry so much. And I can still use this today. Don't worry so much about what people think. Cause people are going to hate you. People are going to love you and you can't control all of it. So mm. it's a waste of time. And I'm, I'm talking to myself right now. Yeah. Uh, it's a waste of time to stew over it, you know? Yeah. So find the people who love you, stick with them, be nice to everybody, be cool. Don't be mean. Don't be hurtful. Don't be vindictive, but find your people. And for me, it's whites only. No, yeah, but you know, <laughs> find your people and uh, stick with them and and uh, absorb them and be be better friends with them and be yourself all the time. Look, there's politeness. There's a uh, you know way to conduct yourself professionally sometimes, but you got to try to be yourself even if it's weird. And yeah. all we do all day long is put on a face and sculpt who we think people will like. I think if you, the more you're you, 
I think uh, the better. Like, don't don't go out of your way and be like, I'm me. I'm going to be naked all the time. I'm not saying no. that. Don't go extreme, but be and, you. Yeah, unless you're a uh, sovereign sire, then you yeah. can do whatever you want uh, with the sriracha yeah. or Drake. Uh, whatever you're into, but yeah, no, that's that's a good point. It it, it feeds off of each other. Uh, when you're yourself, and this is something I'm still figuring out. When you're yourself, that is a, like a filter for letting people into your life that yeah. are only gonna fuck with you. And so, if you're just yourself, your friends will take care of it because people will either hate the shit out of you or or they'll love you but if you kind of be this weird in between of i'm trying to fake it and you're going to attract all these people that may think they like you and then the the walls drop and you're who you actually are and then your yes. your, your quote unquote friends are like well, who the fuck is, exactly. is this guy you're like i've been faking it the whole time and, exactly uh, um but I mean, yeah. that's what instagram is everybody every girl's smoking hot yeah. and then you see what they really look like and you're like whoa and look you got that joy of being hot to everybody for a second but if it ain't reality, it's really not that great. Yeah. You know, so just be the okay looking person. That's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And I know it's harder to swallow because you're like, I want to be hot. I want to be gorgeous. But it's like, well, you know, I want to be 6'4", but it's just not the brakes. Yeah. So, and then the second thing is uh, be a little self-aware. You know, like you got to remember to the monsters, you're the monster. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Like bad guys think you're the bad guy. Al-Qaeda thinks we're fucked up and we go that hey, you're fucked up you're cutting people's heads off and they're like yeah yeah but we're doing it for Allah whatever the hell it is you're fucked up because you have porn and alcohol and all that and gay people and you're like yeah yeah but that's not bad you're bad and they go like no you're bad so you got to remember the monsters think you're the monsters yeah it's like they're the monsters are more scared of you than you are in a lot of ways oh interesting yeah, yeah. so be a little self-aware you know when someone hates you be like why do they hate me what have i done or what's wrong with them or what's wrong with me like actually think about what you're doing to people instead of just pointing fingers this guy sucks yeah. he's uh he doesn't get it fuck him and you're like well what is it that they're not getting about you and maybe how could you be better no one's internalizing now yeah. everybody's just like it's because I'm this. It's because I'm that. That's why they hate me or they don't like me. That's why I'm not advancing. Suck it. Uh, go go yeah. inward a little bit. And maybe there's something wrong with you. There's, how come that guy made it and you didn't? What did he do that you mm -hmm. didn't do? Instead of just saying he made it because he got this and that and I didn't and they don't like me, figure out what's going on with you because someone else did it so you could do it. It's not always their yeah. fault. Sometimes it's your fault. And if you're self-aware, you'll realize, hey, I'm a fucking monster, too. Yes. In, in some ways, everyone has those ways that you're you're hiding from people, uh, from everyone except your true friends. Everyone has right. th those 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 sides to them. So totally great advice. Uh, Mark Norman's Guide to Being Happy. You know, you can't pick that up, but you can pick up uh, Out to Lunch on YouTube. Can, oh, can yeah. you plug everything uh, one more time? Sure. Out to Lunch on YouTube. Give it a whirl. Let's get to 10 million views. It's the stand-ups on Netflix. I got a half hour on there. It just came out. It's a fun, uh, fun batch of material. We Might Be Drunk podcast, Tuesdays with yep. Stories podcast. I have my own Patreon uh, that I do called All Over the Road, and it's me. My friend films me, and we go all over the, the country doing gigs, and I have a, my own podcast. So check it out. Give it a whirl. Tell a friend, and praise Allah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.